Hello everyone, welcome to session 12 of LTech 623. This week, we're all about post-production. That means we're in week three of our four-week cycle, and that means we'll be editing the raw footage from last week and eventually processing it and exporting it so that we can share it. I want to talk about video editing this week. Now, as you probably know, video editing is the process of manipulating and rearranging video shots to create a new work. Now, this is important because this process and the end result can have a major impact on an educational video's visual aesthetics and overall production value. Now, editing typically involves rearranging, adding, removing sections of audio and video clips. It also involves applying color correction, filters, and other enhancements, and it involves creating transitions between clips. Now, the goals of editing encompass a number of things. Sometimes we edit to remove unwanted footage. Sometimes we want to choose the best footage. Sometimes we want to create a certain flow or add effects, graphics, and music. Other times we want to alter the style, the pace, or the mood of the video, or give the video a particular angle or perspective. And all of that can be done through video editing. Now, why does any of that matter? Well, because it impacts viewers. And when it comes to educational videos, we've learned what students notice and complain about. They complain about the quality of video, in other words, its appearance and design. And they also complain about intelligibility and pacing, the latter of which is greatly influenced by the editing process. Now, remember this guy? Well, regardless of whether or not you liked this particular video, the truth is there was a lot of careful editing represented in this video. Someone spent a lot of time in the video editor making this video come together to have a certain pacing and style. So let's watch another example of tight editing and try to count the number of cuts and effects that are packed into just a few seconds of video. Hey, what's up? It's Omar Zakori with Think Media, helping you build your influence with online video. And on this channel, sometimes we do tech gear reviews as well as YouTube home studio setup ideas just like this one. So if you're new here, consider subscribing. So the first thing is the mount, and this is what you would call a photo backdrop mount. And we'll make sure we post links to everything mentioned in this video down in the description. But starting with the mount. So as you can see, this is just a short little clip. And there are a number of sound effects added in and on-screen graphics inserted. But the result is a tight or fast-paced video that is visually interesting and diverse. Now, I want to talk a little bit about jump cuts and transitions. When it comes to video editing, there are different philosophies about how to approach video editing. Most of the time, editing should be hidden. In Hollywood, for example, they often say a great edit is an edit the audience never sees. On the other hand, there may be times when you want the edits of your video to be noticeable in order to create a certain effect or emphasize a particular point. Regardless, a well-edited video will be crisp and flow with precision. So let's take a look at some of the different cuts commonly used in video editing. Now the first cut is called the jump cut, and that's when a single shot is broken up with a hard cut that makes the subject appear to jump instantly forward in time. But no matter the quality, there's always one thing that every good vlog has in common. Jump cuts. Jump cuts have been an editing staple of the classic YouTube style video for about 10 years now. And the best bit, it's probably the easiest part of editing a vlog. A jump cut is a stylistic choice that makes the edit completely visible. Another approach is to jump cut with graphics. Now here's an example. The host is introducing the topic of sonnets and suddenly the video cuts to a relevant graphic. This is a cue, of course, to the viewer that the video is entering a new topic or chapter. So first up is the sonnet. I'm starting with this one because it's probably the first form that comes to mind when you think of a form poem. Oftentimes, jump cuts will show the viewer relevant still images. Now here's an example from Wired Magazine. Notice how the video cuts from the host, the talking head, to still images of Michael Jordan. What's the highest? You might think a dunk legend like Michael Jordan would own the vertical leap record. 
but the highest jumpers... Of course, these still images are animated to keep the visuals interesting and the pace moving forward. But nonetheless, this type of cut is all made possible by using static images. Here's an example with a jump cut with B-roll. In this particular case, the talking head cuts to some B-roll involving some top-down footage. Or even if you are halfway through, I've designed this to help you review specific math concepts and know how to properly use these math concepts when solving chemistry problems. Here's another kind of cut that involves the video suddenly zooming in. This is very popular on YouTube these days, and it is meant to feel like a different camera or different lens was being used. In reality, however, this punch in or punch out effect is just done during the editing to create some visual variety. We need to be able to tell the difference between a faithful interpretation of the numbers and an incomplete or a misleading one. In these 15 episodes, we'll strengthen our data literacy powers together. And Here's another example of a jump cut, but instead of zooming in on the talking head, the shot becomes a tight shot of the speaker's hands and a relevant object. In this case, a light bulb. Design, which just involves passing electric current through a material, making it so hot that it glows. You know, less than 5% of the electrical energy comes out as light. The other 95% is released as heat. Okay, so that's a little bit about jump cuts and transitions. And now I want to talk a little bit about chroma keying. You've probably heard of this before, but chroma keying, popularly called green screening or blue screening, is a visual effect and post-production technique for compositing two images or video streams together based on color hues. And you've seen this a million times in, in the news, in motion pictures, and even in the video game industry. So how does it work? Well, the first step is to record with a solid background color. Typically, this solid background color is a blue or a green. And blues and greens have been used traditionally because they're considered to be the furthest away from human skin tone. Now, what kind of material should you use for this background? Well, ideally, you don't want it to be too reflective. You want your green screen or your blue screen to not have any hot spots where it's really reflecting light. Ideally, lighter and brighter blues or greens are better than darker colors. You want your background to be crease resistant. Wrinkles create shadows and can really mess up the smoothness of the green screen effect. And heavy material is often good because it provides consistent color. So after you record with a solid background, the next part of chroma keying is to import and crop that video appropriately. So you can see here I've had to zoom in and I'm using my rule of thirds to line up my head and I'm filling all of the background with that blue background. I want it to be completely covered. From there, what I need to do in Wii Video is specify the color that I want to be replaced. And this is called keying. We're telling the editing software that we want to replace every pixel with this color with a pixel from another image. And you can do that by clicking on the eyedropper, finding kind of the middle of the color range, and selecting that color. Now the next step is to adjust the color balance. And this setting just adjusts how selective the effect is. The further right you move the slider, the wider the range of tints and shades are removed related to the color that you selected with the eyedropper. Next, you can adjust the color sensitivity, and this setting simply smooths out any pixelation and rough edges of color that might remain. The next step is to defringe the edges of the mask. This setting helps reduce color bleeding at the edges of your mask. The left and right sliders control the level of white and the level of black, respectively. And you can adjust these to help match the edges of the mask with your new background color. Now, ultimately, what you want to do is insert your desired background. Now, importantly, this track should go underneath the keyed footage. And here is an example of the result, where you can see, in this case, me green screened or blue screened on top of this kind of dynamic background. And just to give you a little bit more of an idea of what's possible professionally, here's a 2020 video from SciShow Psych. And of course, you can see there's all kinds of possibilities when it comes to using chroma keying. Okay, everyone, we're out of time for today. Have a great week, and I'll see you in Canvas.